Okay, let's start. Welcome, everybody. This, my friends, is the fourth presidential lecture here at OIS this year. And I'm um, happy to see people coming in to the door and it's quite full in the room. It's great. And uh, as you might remember, the last uh, presidential lecture we had uh, from uh, Professor Fujita um, on self-assembling molecular structures, that uh, sparked many follow-up discussions and interdisciplinary dialogues. And, uh, I am pretty sure that this one will be at least as many um, because this is a very interesting uh, lecture you will hear here today and really in the intersection between disciplines that uh, is, uh, uh, really fits well into OIST culture and the way that we are uh, working over here. So today we are very honored to have Professor Hiroaki Suga uh, who will guide us into his world of uh, biological chemistry. And um, uh, as uh, Pr Professor Suga is uh, an internationally renowned scientist and, uh, whose uh, research spans across the fields of chemistry, biochemistry, medicinal science, and fundamental biology, maybe even some more. Uh, we will hear about that later. So um, among the major achievements uh, in the development of uh, RNA-based catalysts, which have revolutionized the discovery of bioactive peptides, um, yes, I have always also been interested about the intersection between chemistry and biology and had a very nice discussion uh, with uh, Professor Suga here before today. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, that uh, you all will continue to take this opportunity later on. Um, so as a great scientist, Professor Suga is also dedicated to education and mentoring and uh, is also an active promoter of entrepreneurship and internationalization in Japan. Um, in fact, we, uh, we also talked about the, the leadership and importance of uh, how universities should think about this for the future and, uh, and how we are active on, uh, um, on the, all the way from the local to the global level. In uh, 2012, he was awarded the Presidential Award for New Inventions in the Government Industry Academy Relations by the Science Council of Japan. And he's a co-founder of a company, a startup company, PeptiDream, and uh, is the current president of a chemical society of Japan. Um, and so you will hear, I shouldn't really uh, say all these things because you will be introduced, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But uh, I couldn't uh, uh, refrain from saying a little bit of that. Today we are honored to have uh, Professor Sugat Oist for a presidential lecture. And in the series of our presidential lectures, uh, which is bringing some of the brightest minds on the planet, uh, world-renowned scientists and thinkers right here to our beautiful campus at OIST. And so we want them to share not just their groundbreaking discoveries, but also their sheer love and passion for science. We want them to nurture interdisciplinary interactions. Uh, we all have been attracted to OIST for its creative interdisciplinary research as part of its fo um, foundation principles and base uh, to, to pursue innovative ideas. The OIST uh, presidential lecture serves as a catalyst for these interdisciplinary interactions uh, where um, these intera interactions where the, uh, the yet unknown science is to be uh, found. So, my friends, open your mind and get nurtured by the love of science that uh, extends beyond our walls to the benefit for the broader public. And uh, I want you all to welcome Professor uh, Hiro, Hiroaki Suga. Uh, but first, before you applaud for him, <laughs> please, Mala, please take on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I give you a few other uh, 
uh, detail about uh, Professor Suga's background. Professor Suga was born in um, Okayama City. He's a distinguished scientist with an impressive journey in chemistry and chemical biology. After completing his bachelor and master at engineering at Okayama University, he pursued his academic efforts at the MIT for his PhD studies and conducted postdoctoral research in RNA biochemistry with Professor Shostak. Starting his independent career, Professor Suga became a tenure track assistant professor at the New York State University at Buffalo in 1997. Later in 2003, he relocated to the University of Tokyo, where he currently serves as a full professor in the Department of Chemistry. Professor Suga's contributions have been transformative, particularly in pioneering the development of RNA-based enzymes, such as Flexizyme, reprogramming the genetic code. His background work also led to the creation of rapid system, is utilizing direct evolution for producing a selective macrocyclic peptides. Beyond his scientific accomplishment, Professor Suga is a recognized leader in scientific community, currently serving as a president of the Chemical Society of Japan and the founding editor-in-chief of RSC Chemical Biology. He actively promotes education, trains PhD students, and encourages entrepreneurship. Professor Suga diverse talent extends to his passion for playing and collecting electric guitars, showing a multifaceted individual dedicated to advancing science and foresting academic and cultural connections. Through his creatives and ambitious interdisciplinary work, Professor Suga exemplified the spirit of passion, curiosity, and rigor of the distinguished list of our previous speakers at the OIST Presidential Lecture. Thank you for coming, and please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the President Marokides, and uh, uh, it's a great opportunity to come here, and it's really a great pleasure to see how uh, OIST evolved in the last uh, 10 years, actually. I haven't been in 10 years, almost. And uh, this is a really big change uh, uh, 10, from 10 years ago to now, and really s great to see you, and thank you for Bora to communicate with me, and also uh, uh, very kind introduction. So mm -hmm. let me speak about uh, my research today. Uh, you, these days I use the iPhone to control everything. So, uh, okay, so this is going to be. Uh, today's title is like this, but every time I change it a little bit and then I don't, often I don't know what title was, but today the pseudo natural peptides and products and the neobiotics. It's covering a whole bunch of different modality of the therapeutics and for the application. So, uh, so this is the first slide I often show to the people that are interested in developing a drugs. On the left, uh, this is a small organic molecule that the uh, pharmaceutical industry have really made an effort to develop the drugs. And this is a molecular waste size about 500 Dalton. And the reason of this is that very often we can develop the oral available drugs. But of course, the small molecule has also the uh, pros and cons. You can get to the oral available, you can have a very cheap to synthesize, but very often you have a suffering from side effects. On the right, this is a biologics uh, represented by antibodies. And this molecule, molecular weight is 150,000 Daraton. So it's a huge uh, molecule. Um, but it's, of course, the biologics is a very good uh, uh, to, to define the molecules that specifically interact with target and, then, and, and giving a very long life, lifetime in your body that you can circulate around in the blood in an over a uh, few weeks. So the pharmacokinetics are very good. On the other hand, it is never be all are available because it's too big. So uh, when I started this project quite some time ago, it's over 40, 20 years ago, that we decided to work on something different from anybody else. And then that's the, what the macrocyclic peptides are. 
So at the time, there is even not a popular talking about the macro cycle as a new modality of the molecule, new type of the molecules. But it's really the idea is actually the macro cycle would be a very interesting scaffold because of the size of the molecular weight. It's probably less than 2,500 Dalton. And the chirality rich and confirmation rich. And of course, it becomes a three dimensional rich. So it's, as a drug candidate, it's probably a very interesting molecule. The major inspiration, I mean, before that, sorry, sorry. The, uh, this is a, a, a view of the size that you're looking at. This is the left one is the, the uh, cyan blue is the typical size of the protein target. And the yellow one is the molecules that I'm interested in. And then the right ones are smaller molecules. And you will see the whole entire antibody structure. You can see how the difference between the one molecule to the other, the size wise. So the inspiration of the macro cycle comes from natural product. And this is, it's called the uh, cyclosporin A and uh, isolated from fungus. And turned out to be, of course, the fungus doesn't produce the molecules for human. It's basically fungus wants to kill the uh, environment, other competitors around the fungus. But turned out to be this molecule is the immunosuppressive agent for human, accidentally. But this molecule is a very interesting, the old peptidic molecule. However, the very interesting structure structural features around. So this is a, a normal uh, peptide bond is NHCO, but this has a lot of N-methylated CO. And then plus, uh, there are some cytochains that which is quite unique, but also here the alanine, but this is a D-alanine. And then there is a structure of the macrocycle. So all of these structural features together this, uh, 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 the cyclosporin A becomes uh, a very uh, uh, strong potent inhibit, the potent uh, uh, molecules bind to the cyclophilins uh, to recruit the carmodulin that makes it the immunosuppressive activity. But also the, uh, the structural features gives you the membrane permeability and also the, uh, the, the protease resistance. So, um, this is really the inspiration that we wanted to uh, discover this type of the molecules. But the fact is that looking for natural product is not so easy to do. Um, and now it's a, people are trying to do a more data, uh, the, the genomic, genome data mining to discover the natural product. But at the time, 20 years ago, I was interested in studying it. There is not such a uh, technology is not available. But instead, I want to make it something physically synthesized uh, cyclosporin A-like library, and then you screen effectively active molecules as against uh, any drug target of the human. So the goal is, what I set it up, is that I want to have molecule to synthesize as a library is uh, over a million, uh, a trillion molecules. Not a million, a trillion different molecules. The reason is this is 10 to the 12 idea comes from the antibody diversity. Antibody diversity is 10 to the 8th of the germline, and then hypermutation gives you about the 10 to the 11th. So the 10 to the 11th of different molecules can be synthesized, then you should be able to get the molecules that very strongly bind to the target. Because the antibody took care of the, most of the uh, drug, uh, the protein target to be uh, 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 to remove them from our body, right? So this is a very, very nice evolution system. So you need to have over 10 to the 11th different molecules. So I set the goal with the 10 to the 12, 10 times more. And then uh, uh, I set the goals to screen the molecule, to discover the molecules within a month, okay? So in a month, you have to get solution uh, after you start in that project. So I started developing uh, methods. First, we have to synthesize uh, molecules, and how we're going to synthesize the treated in different sequences. And I decided to use the, uh, the uh, protein synthesis machinery, so a ribosome translation system. But translation system won't take uh, the N-methyl amino acid or D-amino acid, that which I mentioned in uh, uh, the, the uh, cyclosporin A. So I have to come up different ways to overcome the problem. 
And then also the screening method, which I'm going to tell you about how, how we can do, achieve the goal. So um, there are many e efforts that I had to make this to be realized. This is called the Flexzyme, and this is one of the, my most important invention. Uh, this is RNA catalyst isolated from completely random sequence, but this sequence was isolated by uh, many experiments, that, which I don't discuss today. But outcome is this, the 45 nucleotide and 46 nucleotide lengths of the uh, flexozymes are able to charge a variety of different amino acids on the transfer RNA. So for, I show you the, here, the three prime end of the sequence is complementary to the three prime end of the transfer RNA. And this transfer RNA, when it binds, the flexozyme create a cavity, and this goes to uh, bind into the substrate and then bring it into the, uh, uh, the amino isolation on the transfer RNA. The reason we, not, we need to make amino isolation on transfer RNA, this is enables us to change the genetic code, which is I, I tell you in a minute. So um, this tool enables to charge different amino acids and on, the, on the transfer RNA of the three prime end of the hydroxyl group. But the recognition of the dysflexzyme happens only this dinitrobenzyl ester group. So it doesn't care about the side chain, doesn't care about the amino group, side, doesn't care about the chirality. So you can f change the completely different side chain or n methylated amino acids, acetylated amino, amino acid, and D amino acid on an even beta amino acid. So this is kind of the, all the uh, uh, amino acid that usually translation system won't tank into the peptide chain. But if you charge this on the, amino acid, uh, it, on the transfer RNA, we can change the genetic code. So I will show you in the next slide. So and the, this, I show you the, on the left, sorry, on the left is the uh, uh, for, formylomethionines as an initiator. And generally, the translation system enables to elongate formylomethionine to the rest of the amino acid chain. And on the right, this is the chain uh, uh, amino acid chain coding the, the, uh, the genetic code. So we have a 20 different amino acids there. So from here, we remove uh, formidomethionine in a, a reconstituted in vitro translation system. So this is a cell-free translation system that you are enabled to uh, manipulate gradient of the um, uh, translation system. So I remove first the formidomethionine, okay? So now you lose the methionine in a genetic code. Therefore, you cannot initiate translation. However, if you place this chloroacetyl D tryptophan, this is anything you can put it in, but just as an example, and this is one molecule that we very, really like it. Um, this will be available for the initiation since that we use a flexzyme to charge this on the initiator tRNA. And that automatically, this molecule is assigned to the initiator. And then translation takes place after this chloroacetyl D tryptophan using on the right uh, the genetic code, but then we remove, we, we set it up uh, the N NU uh, combination uh, sequence. NNU is the first two bases are random sequence. So all the possible UCAG will be appearing, and the second also. But then the last base we chose as a U. So now it's all black letters can be still usable for this genetic code. But then we remove the father of the certain amino acids. As an example, I removed the phenylalanine, leucine, isoleucine, and alanine. And then we replace with endometrial amino acids or beta amino acid, gamma amino acid, D, D amino acid, which I'm going to discuss today further. So let's say that this is the first example that we, we published in 2020, 2011, that we placed the amino acids into the genetic code. So in this way, you can actually use this genetic code, and now it's the five different non-standard amino acids are in the genetic code, and you can express by the ribosome. So we synthesize the DNA template, and then you transcribe in vitro, and then to form the messenger RNA. Now this messenger RNA starts from the initiation, and then followed by random sequence of NNU repeat, 
And we, we actually length has a 10 and 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 uh, repeat. So what mixture of the lengths. And then the lastly, we place the uh, assisting uh, codon. So when you, the, the transition takes place, you will see uh, D tryptophan with chloroacetyl group at the end of terminus, and you have a peptide sequence. And if you hit that N-methyl amino acid codon boxes by the random sequence, and you incorporate the N-methyl amino acid, and then lastly, we put the cysteine on it. So this was synthesized peptides, and the N terminus, so this is from very much chemistry, the N terminus is a chloroacetyl group, and a cysteine of the cytochrome is a thiol group, and this spontaneously react to form the macrocycle. So you form the thioether bond. Thioether bond is a non-reducible bond, stable in vivo. So this is a really uh, lock stable a bond that is cyclized. We actually use a, this thioether bond formation. At that time, it wasn't very popular at all in the peptide field. People tried to make it macrocycle with a uh, normal uh, peptide bond formation. It's very difficult. So I changed the mind to make a thioether bond. And this makes a huge impact because we get always a quantitative, independent from the sequences. Now this method becomes extremely popular. Everybody do macrocyclization by doing this similar way. So um, that really changed everything for macrocyclization. So we made this uh, by translation system, but you have to screen because we make uh, 10 to the 12 different sequences. So trillion different sequences cannot be analyzed by independently because it's almost one molecule, single molecule in the tube. So we attach the, uh, to the messenger RNA. So I'm gonna go through this uh, messenger RNA display system. So um, this DNA, originally developed by Jack Shostak, my former uh, postdoc mentor, um, he developed concept. So we tweak the, this ideas in combination with the genetic code reprogramming. So that we, the messenger RNA has a constant sequence that we design and that we chemically synthesize DNA and the three prime end that has a peg linker and then we have a CC pyromycin. Pyromycin is the antibiotics to terminate translation system. So when this is annealed together and then we, we often the ligates at the end and then you subject it to the translation system, and you start from chloroacetyl D tryptophan, you random sequence and cysteine, and then you, 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 you make a translation to take place, and the ribosome will go through the translation to the end. We usually have uh, the, the, the release factor one comes into this, and then cleaves the ester bond to release the peptide from uh, uh, messenger RNA. But this is not what we want. We want to keep the peptide and the messenger RNA together. So that's why we use the pyromycin system. We remove the pure, uh, release factor one from the translation system. So the, all the methods that Jack Shostak developed, they don't do it. So it's a, the fusion efficiency was very, very poor. But we remove the release factor one Ribosome does not know how to cleave the ester bond, so there we can cheat the better with the, uh, uh, the pyromycin to come in and then ligate it. So now, you, at the end, you have all peptide and peptide through the messenger RNAs are connected, okay? So this peptide sequence is encoded on this messenger RNA. So spontaneous macrocyclization takes place, and then we do Debus transcription to make sure that we have cDNA together, and this thioether macrocyclic peptide displayed on the messenger RNA cDNA complex, and then we apply to the drug target. So we do, drug target was immobilized on the bees, and then you select uh, strong binders. Now you need to recover is only the cDNA. So you take the cDNA off, and then you do PCR to amplify it. So now we can make 1,000 copy or even 10,000 copy of the molecules, depending on what the selection pressure you gave. Um, but then you made a 10,000 copy, starting from one copy to the 1,000 copy, and then you're going to repeat this cycle. 
Okay, even though you have a trillion different sequences, you do go around like four round, five rounds, you just basically, you get very good candidates of the pool. So you do a, a second generation sequencer, you get many sequences to read the same sequence, and then that's the answer. So we're going back to what the sequence was and what the genetic code was reprogrammed, and you look at what the sequence is supposed to be, and we do chemical synthesis. So you can provide a huge amount of the, the molecules by chemical synthesis. So this is very often people ask, can you use this to synthesize a molecule? We can synthesize a molecule a small amount, not a huge amount because it's very expensive to deprogram the genetic code. But once you know the answer, its best solution is a chemical synthesis. So we do chemical synthesis. Okay, so um, this is a rapid platform system summary. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we, the, the, uh, the very good ways of the high cost performance, it's we use usually only use the 100 micro trans, microliter translation system, tiny bit, and to, the later round is only less than five microliter. So it's a very, very small amount of translation system that you need to use it. And then you, so you can actually uh, very cheaply screen a drug candidate. And the rabbit turnover, I told you that I want to do the one month. It turned out to be less than two weeks. We can actually get two weeks now you get to the drug candidate to know what, it, what you have to synthesize. And uh, uh, basically, uh, rest of the part is the high affinity to ligand, very low nanomora to sub nanomora, and the success rate is very, very high too. So uh, I just wanted to tell you about the, the problem that I faced. So this was a 2011. We got worked out everything in the n methyl amine acids and, 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 and into the peptide chain, and we demonstrated we can do the selection. But we had a, a big issue to, uh, to, to present it. Very often the audience asks, can you put in the D amine acids into the peptide chain? So I show you, 2013, we had this result. We tried to make it which one amino acid, D amino acid can be incorporated. We screened all 20 D, uh, 19 D amino acid. Uh, the glycine is achiral, so it's 19 amino acids. And we, we, we show you here the, all the, uh, uh, the blue bars that are appearing on, on this figure uh, are the possible that you can incorporate into the peptide chain. So previously, a lot of people couldn't get it, and we actually able to do quite a good quite well, but not, not all of them, but some of them are very poor and some of them are okay. But the biggest problem is, uh, I'm gonna skip this, biggest problem is the consecutive d amino acid incorporation. So if you consecutively d amino acid try to incorporate it, we have a zero success. And if you have a d, LD, still very poor. So virtually, in this case, so uh, I'm gonna do this, the lighting, uh, this word. So I said the double incorporation of the D-alanine, D-phenylalanine, which is a very good amino acid to incorporate a single amino acid, but we can't do double uh, or alternative, alternative uh, alter alter alternating uh, incorporation of the uh, D amino acids. So it's, it's basically you can't synthesize as a library. So we came up uh, a solution by studying a basic study of the uh, uh, tRNA. So this is called the uh, 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 protein tRNA. And a protein is a very poor amino acid for normal protein synthesis in cells. So the nature solved problems based on developing another protein. It's called the EFP. So EFP basically stop the drop off during the slow process of the peptide uh, transfer reaction. So what happens is, I show you the D amino acid here, but this is the same as the proline amino acid. So we, we, we supposed that D amino acids are so slow to do that. So before getting the peptide bond formed, peptide tRNA drop off takes place. So the nature, D, D amino, I'm sorry, the protein amino acid often happens this. So 
the, the uh, EFP evolved and, and that stopped the peptide T and the drop offs. So we have applied to the D amino acid, and this will help to make it the D amino acid bond formation. So we, we uh, made a, a, this chimera tRNA that has the uh, effective in, uh, recruitment of the EFTU. It's a very uh, technical details for <laughs> translation system, but the, please listen it. I'm sorry. EFP can recruit the pro DM, and this is the way they really solve the problem. And it took a long time for us to, to, to understand that, that why this didn't work, and then we now has a solution. So eventually, we are able to succeed even the D, 3D consecutive a peptide bond formation in a ribosome to make a macro cycle like this. So um, this is really the, uh, the only the tRNA which we use. This we engineered the tRNA, it's called PRO-E2, is the possible for incorporation of the D consecutive amino acid. But this didn't stop to the D amino acid. We can even expand to the beta amino acid. Again, the beta amino acid was a big problem that we can't incorporate consecutive beta amino acid. But having this new tRNA, we are able to uh, add three different uh, cyclic beta amino acid into the uh, genetic code. So in this genetic code, we have one, two, three of these three type of the beta amino acids. And then we assign a starting from D uh, tyrosine and a D cysteine to close the bond. So this is a design that we made for the new genetic code. So we, we took uh, uh, the selection against the human factor 12A. This is one of the protease uh, drug target. And then we uh, find the molecules. So, so this is the slide which I, I show you. Um, there are two, a little bit too busy slides, so I'm going to expand it. Only two, I mean, two peptides that which we are interested in, F3 and F4. These peptides have the two beta amino acids in here. And then KD against the uh, human factor 12A is a single digit nanomora. And KI inhibitory activity is almost the same, it's one nanomora. So it's a very strong inhibitor. And this shorter version is about tenfold less active, but still 10 nanomolar of the KI, which is a very potent inhibitor. And we sh also showed that this nature chemistry paper that how selective it is. It's a really selective. We don't see any uh, other protease inhibitory activity uh, using these two peptides. We are able to get the solution of the structure. Uh, this, this red part is a the beta amino acid, you can see the very nice turn structure appearing here and rigidify the whole entire turn structure, and this also. But we also see the happy, happy, happy to see this is the cyclohexane ring is interacting with the protein surface. That means that these hydrophobic molecules contribute to the binding. So the stability of the serum is very important. Now we, we witnessed already the other examples that we have. It's very often we incorporate this cyclic beta amino acid. It becomes very stable against the human serum proteases. So in this case, the, the F4 shorter version was over 10 days. We don't see any, we don't see uh, more than half of the molecule remained intact. And F3 is a little less stable, but still you can have something uh, several days uh, to, to remain in, in uh, the serum. So it's really the beta amino acid gave you a stability secure, so it's a better to drug candidate. And very recently, oh, let's see. Yeah, this is a better one. So we, we recently published, uh, this project was started in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, this, so we, we wanted to put the gamma amino acid. This is another difficult amino acid that you can place in. So, but this MURA had really made an effort to make it these molecules can be incorporated into the peptide chain. And uh, we, because of the middle of the pandemic, uh, we built this library and then we took against to the uh, COVID-19's drug target is the uh, main protease. So this target 
it's very hot at the time, and so um, we lashed it, but it was, was, took a long time to get the paper out. Uh, it's almost nature chemistry hold it one year to publish it. So I was very upset about that. But anyway, we finally published. So uh, the molecules I'm going to just discuss is the GM4. And this molecule has a one gamma amino acid in, in the near the middle of the sequence. And the inhibitory activity is about the 5 nanomora, 50 nanomora and a 5 nanomora KD. And we have uh, some improvement of the uh, uh, mutation by the mutations, 10 nanomora KD, uh, IC50. So this is a, a non-covalent inhibitor. Any inhibitor is known in, in the literature now is all covalent inhibitor. And this is a non-covalent inhibitor with a 10 nanomora range, and it is probably the most potent inhibitor ever made. So we had also X-ray structure. This was collaboration with the uh, Oxford University people in Chris Schofield. And we have a very good collaboration with them uh, continuously. And this is a structure that we solved. And then this is a peptide uh, three-dimensional structure. We have a gamma amino acid sitting here and there. And uh, uh, this is the whole entire uh, structure that I showed you. So this is uh, a gamma amino acid in the sitting and then very close by to the, uh, the cleavage side of the substrate. And that actually prevented the cleavage because of the uh, gamma amino acid. And then this is the warhead uh, the, uh, getting to the active site and then pre pre inhibit uh, the peptide bond uh, cleavage. So uh, it's, a, it's a really unexpected structure, but the gamma amino acid playing a very important role in this. So we have a more improvement of this. Now it's about the, uh, 100 picomora IC50 molecules appeared. So we're probably going to repeat in the near future. Okay, one quick uh, example before changing a topic. Um, this is a Prexin B1, and this is a very important uh, target molecule uh, the, the, the bone involving in the bone homeostasis. And the semaphore D, which is a ligand, and the Prexin B1 is a membrane-bound protein. And when they inject each other, they form the dimer, and then this will send a signal that stop the differentiation. So the uh, osteoblast cells generally stop the differentiation, so the bone of, uh, formation is stopped. The bone homeostasis means that you actually break the bone, forming a bone, break the bone, the forming a bone. So that means that this bone differentiation stops, that basically bone doesn't repair. So uh, we decided to work on the inhibitor of this interaction, protein-protein interaction, then we found that this molecule that which is allosterically inhibit with a KD of the 3.5 nanomole, again, it's a very strong binder and a nicely wrap around the part of the protein, and uh, that makes it allosterically inhibit interaction. So we set the uh, collaboration with another scientist in uh, Tokyo uh, uh, Medical Dental School, and this group worked on this uh, semaphore D structure. So uh, this, this is something that which I just talked with you. But that's not the work. <laughs> this is a different work. But this is a one that which I can tell you because we, we have all the patent disclosed. So uh, this molecule uh, works uh, So uh, with the, the animal model. So this uh, animal model is a female mice that which we removed the ovary. And this is a very well established animal model that when that this type of the uh, animal has a developing a very weak bone. So they actually can't keep maintaining bone uh, strong. So uh, we so this this we, we took this animal model and then and, and inject our molecules over 13 weeks uh, four times and, and then see how the uh, uh, the bone can recover. So I shown you here that this is a uh, wild type normal uh, mice that which has a very good dense bone, and this is uh, the mice, the model that Albany was removed. You see the very weak uh, bone inside, but then when you administrate the molecules, then you can get to the, this dose. You basically recover the entirely the wild, the normal mice bone strength, and this is a little bit maybe overdose, and it makes it even stronger uh, bone. So it's really interesting that this type of the smaller molecule you inject, you can change the, uh, uh, the, the strength of the bone. 
Okay, so I'm going to skip uh, uh, explanation of the cyclosporin A, that of which I told you are many different modifications. But in natural product, there are some uh, molecules that which we can't synthesize by genetic code reprogramming. Particularly, for instance, this dehydroalanine and oxazole or thiazole, these are difficult for us to do by the incorporation of the genetic code reprogramming. So we became interested in how we're going to install this type of the molecules into the peptide chain. And this particular lactazole A natural product has a pyridine ring to cyclize the macrocycle. So it's a very unique molecule. So how this does work is actually using enzyme. Setting through an cysteine, enzyme modification takes place to cyclize the backbone to form the, the oxazole oxazoline and oxazole eventually. And then the other one is to simply eliminate water to form the dihydroalanine. So this is a great enzymes, enzymes that remove the water in the water, right? So it's really nice enzymes. So we look at the biosynthesis of this cyclos, uh, the, the uh, uh, cyclic molecules that is called lactazole A, so-called the thiopeptide, thiazole containing peptides. So this molecule, lactazole A, that we studied all these bunch of different homologs, and, this, and the lactazole A is a little unique, so we decided to work on this lactazole A. So there are two people involved, Yuki Goto and Alex Bikunadorov in my group, and the collaboration with Onaka's group in the original person that we discovered the lactazole A. So we took all enzymes, genes and express and then purify and then we try to reconstitute all entire biosynthesis machinery in vitro. So the goal is that we wanted to synthesize this natural product in one tube, in one part, and within a day. So that's our goal. We always set the goal, you know, something we have to achieve. So, uh, so the, I'm going to stepwise explain this. So the, the biosynthesis takes place from the DNA to transcribe the messenger RNA and then translate to form this long chain of peptide. This has extra sequence, it's called RIDA sequence. This is the sequence is important to recruit the first enzyme to mod start modifying the core se sequences. And the second step is the following, it's a very important part. LAS-D, LAS-E, two enzymes, depending on what the cysteine or serine is, and then it's cyclized the backbone to the azorine, and then LAS-F is oxidative enzyme to make it las -or. And then the next step is just the acidation occurs to the uh, serine residues, and then LAS-F, which is the same enzyme as this, will eliminate to the di di dehydroalanine. And the last step is a very interesting for chemists, uh, the two uh, dehydroalanine, one of them are totemized, and having a 2,4 cycle addition takes place to give you pyridine ring. But at the same time, they, they cleave this bond. So this cleave the bond, and then you form the macrocycle, and they get rid of the, this leader sequence away. So uh, we, we decided to perform everything this in one part. So we, we took every single enzyme to study how long we have to incubate, how long we have to do, uh, uh, what the conditions you want to do, and then we figured out everything. And at the end, we have done with this kind of uh, conditions, uh, the 16 hours incubation and the six hours incubation later with the, uh, two sets of the different enzymes. And that gives you the exact natural product in one part. Okay, so this is a probably automate natural product synthesis in a day, and so we can achieve that. But that's not only our purposes. We wanted to change the sequence. We want to change the uh, the structure of the natural product. So in this case, that we are trying to scan everything alanine to define which residues are critical for making a macrocycle, to complete the natural product like molecule. And we, we, we found that any peaks here, the form of the product, you're missing a peak, that's critical, so we go through all these things. And then you're missing some of the part in here. So that's the answer, that's one here, and then there's a four other residues are important. And then that tells you that you can do a macrocyclization. Okay, so uh, 
now we are interested in seeing that uh, uh, the ink sizes, because we can change the ink sizes, it's a very interesting. So we try to do that. So we have uh, 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 different ink sizes we, we all go through. The fact is, most of the cases that we can still cyclize it. So um, the next slide is a summary of what we get. So this is ring sizes difference and different sequences as well. So you see here the very small sizes like this. So this is one of the large sizes that we made. And this is a typical size of the ring size. So in this case, we can actually uh, see that a variety of the sequences, a variety of the ring sizes can be synthesized by deconstituted biosynthesis machinery. In vivo, in vivo, in a cellular system, you can't do this very well because you, you don't know how stable they are and so on, but this is all possible in vitro system. So you can combine together with the genetic code reprogramming, you can create a completely different uh, natural product. So now we want to do uh, uh, selection. So it's basically we want to screen a new activity based on what we get. So, so the system you can probably imagine that you can just combine together with the mRNA display system. So now instead of the sequence that we made, this is going to be random sequence. So we made a random sequence and we, we, we tried to do the selection. So uh, this case that this is a kind of the design, uh, I, I don't go through this in the steps. This is a little bit uh, time consuming to do that. I'm gonna skip this, but anyway, that we can do the selection. It's very similar to what we, we did in the previous three. And at this time we actually made a target to the TNIC, which is an intracellular target. Uh, this is a kinase that downstream of the winter signal. So it's related to the cancer development. We had a quite a few candidates that we against, against the TNIC, but one of them, T, T, TIP50, TP15, is the very potent molecule. This is a single digit nanomolar KD, uh, 14 nanomolar of IC50, and we found extremely selective to the TNIC. And there is another one, but this is one that which is exactly the same catalytic site. So it's, a, it's a definitely the inhibitor. So we're happy to see this selectivity and then we took the X-ray structure. So the X-ray structure tells us that the, pep the peptide region is really binding to the substrate region and very well to inhibit the, uh, the kinase. And the, the, there are some specific interaction that we are monitoring. And here is a very interesting, this uh, pyridine ring uh, frat structure also makes an interaction with the uh, aromatic cluster in the enzyme. So it's already unexpected, but this is the kind of things that we expected to obtain by the uh, treaty on different sequences in the library. Um, nowadays, we are very interested in intracellular activity because the, this is a remaining challenge for the peptide people to work on whether or not this molecule can go in the cells and inhibit the cells, uh, cellular activity. And then this is a case that we're looking at the membrane permeability. It's called Kappa. Uh, assay, one of the assay, the chloroalkane penetration assay developed by Josh Kritzer in the Tufts University. And we monitor this about uh, 10 nanomora or five nanomora, uh, I'm sorry, five micromora uh, penetration effectivity, uh, which is the same as TAT. And we have uh, uh, molecules that it's now it's getting a better uh, membrane permeable molecules, but now it's to, today I can't tell you in a minute, the, in, the, today. but. At least we see the intracellular activity. This is what we're monitoring downstream of the signaling cascade, and we are able to see inhibitory activity. So again, this is a specific inhibitor, and so uh, this, the comparing with the non-specific small molecule, uh, of course they are very potent molecules, but they're non-specific, so uh, we're very happy to see that it's not uh, too far away from the, what the, the uh, small molecule inhibitors are. So the final topic I tell you about the Russell grafting. This is a really big collaboration between my group and the Osaka University Junichi Takagi's group. And very recently that, well, we have a very good collaboration with the Matsu, Matsumoto's group for a long time, but it is also he's really working on together with us for a new uh, neobiologics project. 
So um, briefly, this is a repeat, so I won't talk about anything in details, but difference what I told you is we have a lot of different interesting uh, amino acids, non-standard amino acid incorporation in the middle. But if you don't do that, it's just a normal peptide, and it just, as far as we can cyclize it, this also gave you very good binder using a rapid selection system. So basically macrocycle, and then you have a peptide chain that is all natural amino acid. It's still very potent binder. So you can, it's, it's, I show you the one example. This is a, a peptide against the MET, and this will get you, uh, I don't go to details about this, but it's uh, um, forming uh, uh, the induction of the dimerization, then you can send a signal to cell growth and differentiation. So this is the molecules that we isolated, the three, uh, four peptides, and the three peptides we studied a lot. This is all a single digit nanomora peptide, and then we link it together with the dimers. So the idea itself is if you make it this peptide to incubate with a MET, MET can be dimerized, so you can send the signal downstream. The fact is the following, it's like we can send all the signal downstream. Uh, it's very, activity is very resemble to uh, HGF, which is natural uh, protein ligand. So selectivity is also the same, HGF specifically activate the MET. Our peptide dimers are also able to select, selectively activate MET. And then you, we, fall, we show that the phenotypic behavior is exactly the same. So you can uh, you use the RP tech, this particular uh, cell, cell lines that you can use to form uh, uh, those uh, tube-like uh, structure. So we we very excited this, but then is we stopped developing further because this is really you can't do uh, uh, the human application. So we came up new ideas about Russell grafting. And the reason we wanted to do is um, we want to com completely cover the rest of the molecular weight size by this new method. So the molecule that which I told you, we have all these X-ray structures solved in the macro cycle with all natural amino acid. And we, I show you the six examples. And it all shows a very different structure, beta sheet-like stru structure, alpha helical structure, or completely cycle of structure. And, but only the thing is the same, commonly shared, is this red bond. Red, uh, the, between the red uh, atoms to the atoms. So this is a thioether bond. So thioether bond is always exposed to the solvent, which makes sense because this is connecting to the mes messenger RNA. So uh, basically the peptide binds to use this middle part, not the thioether bond part. But we know that if you remove the thioether, we lose the activity by 100 fold. So virtually inactive. We consider one micromora is inactive. So uh, if you don't get one nanomora range, it's, it's inactive. So this turned out to be a, not appreciable activity. However, uh, if we can place in a part of the loop of the protein. Now you, you mimic macrocycle because the protein can fold it and the peptide itself is, very, is going to be folded by themselves as far as the end is close each other, close, close each other, proximity. So uh, Takagi came up with the idea that can we do this experiment? And I said, well, interesting, let's do it. And so we, we inserted the, our uh, pharmacophore peptide sequence in the genome. So this is a messenger RNA that the containing the loop replaced with the, our macrocyclic peptide pharmacophore sequence. So it's no longer macrocycle, but it's a loop. So we encoded everything in the messenger RNA expressed. So this idea, we do rapid selection using my technology and once you know the sequence of what you want to s synthesize, we usually, usually go to the chemical synthesis to study it. 
but instead take this information of the sequence, and then you encoding into the messenger RNA, and then you express protein, and then you see whether or not it can bind to the target. So as an example, I show you here is a, a FC domain of the antibody. So antibody, know, you know that this FAB fragment of the CDR region is the responsible for binder. However, FC domains are also very important because this is the molecule that which allows you to saturate the antibody. So the molecule itself has a low role to bind to the FCRN, and so you can actually have a, a longer uh, pharmacokinetics. So this is a very good molecule, but doesn't have any binding ability to the different targets. However, this has a loops. So now you're actually ready to insert pharmacophore molecule that which we use this, our rapid system to find a new peptide, de novo peptide sequence ta targeting to the particular protein, and then you insert it to the, this FC domain. So you, can have, you have a six loops, so you can actually place it where you want, and the, you, can, you don't need to restrict it by yourself. It's a single molecule, it's a different kind of molecules so it can be in, inserted. So this is a three-dimensional view. It's a topology is a little different. So it's always dimetic. So you have a two different, to, three different topology if you look at these uh, six loops location. So this example that, that I told you about the MET interaction of the peptide, and you dimerized it, and then it actually made a active for uh, activating a MET. So the, for the FC, of course, it doesn't bind to the MET, so it doesn't really do any binding to the mat. However, once you, you graft it to the loop, now this FC becomes a binder to the mat. Now all the location that we made in this bottom, bottom part all become binder. But binding does not necessarily give you the agonistic activity because the, the, sometimes it's important how the molecule can assemble together. So we made all combinations. So in the case, I don't explain all of them, but it's a, this site was one of the, the most uh, uh, active sites, B3, and a B1, B2, B3, and then these are kind of things that are also uh, uh, different locations, but it's a, all these uh, uh, peptide sequence makes it uh, the, the agonistic activity. So we're very excited to see, particularly with this particular uh, peptide sequence with the B, B3 site, it makes a really nice, uh, uh, agonistic activity. So the selectivity and downstream signaling, it's all rely on the peptide sequence, so we see the exactly the same behavior. So regardless of this FC or peptide dimer, uh, it does work. The reason we became interested in doing this way is the saturation, pharmacokinetics. So now it's the uh, uh, HGF natural ligand is in a clinical trial. But this is only for uh, spinal cord injury. So you have to topologically inject and, and then cure, the, this, cure the, uh, the, this cells to regenerate. Um, but you can't inject it for, for, for the bloodstream because it's too unstable. So you see that this example, if you put the, the HGF, inject immediately, it's gone because the instability of the proteins. Basically, you lose the everything. So you can't really reach the, the patient, the, uh, the, the tissues by the injection. You have to go to topologically, directly inject it to the region. On the other hand, you see here that our, our uh, FC, of course, but our, the grafted FC, we call it mirror body, this will stay in the body without any problem. So this is over uh, 200 hours, 300 hours. It's exactly the same behaviors as uh, FC molecules, like antibody. It stays long, right? 10 days, still, we see that effective concentration of the MET can be detained. So it's a very long uh, uh, pharmacokinetics life. So we're looking at the model that humanized the, uh, the, the uh, liver was uh, uh, prepared to this transgenic mice, 
and then we inject it to see that we can activate the liver by this uh, Mira body. And so you see here that uh, uh, we're looking at the messenger RNA uh, uh, expression level. And then you see all of the cases, as you see here, the, the, the control versus the uh, Mira body that makes it uh, activation of the liver. So this enables us to inject to, to activate the liver. Uh, HGF is actually uh, expressed from the liver. But of course, there are the diseases like uh, NASH, for example, that's what we're really working on for this as a drug. So try to repair the liver by the molecule to, to inject. So uh, this is one thing that which we are trying to do. But another thing is we are interested in delivering these molecules into the brain. The reason is that there is a, a Alzheimer's disease and ARS and MS and many things that people have suggested. Maybe if we can bring it, this activations into the brain, maybe we can cure certain diseases in the brain. But there is not an effective way to deliver the, the, the molecules to the brain. So we decided to work on this way. Maybe next slide. I don't know. This is the way. So uh, we made a molecules that uh, FAB molecules that which has the uh, binding to uh, transferrin receptor. So this is what we call other body that a, uh, antibody plus antibody against the transferrin receptor, and then we inserted the MET molecules in here. So now uh, we, we're expecting that a molecule like this is a bispecific antibody. It binds to the MET, binds to the uh, uh, transferrin. So we inject it, and it eventually gets to the, uh, uh, this so we're looking at the interactions with the uh, uh, MET and also transferrin. So this is uh, the, the experiment. We're looking at how much of the molecule went to the brain. And in, in, in it turned out to be this uh, uh, one arm antibody, other body, it gave a really nice accumulation into the brain in the delivery. So it's less than much amount of the, the molecules detained in the uh, uh, bloodstream, and it goes to the brain more effectively. So this concept, lasso graft, can apply to the variety of different proteins, regardless of proteins that we demonstrated all these type of the molecules protein molecules can be utilized as a scaffold and we grafting to it. So this is one of the, un the published data and the plus unpublished data. So this is the one that we published. We use this concept to the apply to the AAV, so it's a, the vehicle to deliver the gene. And so we demonstrate that in this case is one of the group we inserted targeting to, uh, maybe this is a good one, the MET. And this is a different uh, uh, plexin B1 that which I mentioned for the bone. And you, you generated the molecules that AAV that specifically deliver the genes to the cells that express target molecule. So we don't touch the, any cells, but it's only the cells that are expressing target protein. So this was utilized, so this is a little bit unpublished data, but uh, this is data that I showed you for delivering the, more, the uh, genes to the brain, more specifically. So that we took AAV9 wild type. This is a control experiment that we demonstrated day seven, day, day 14. You see that the delivery is brains almost nothing, but it's already well delivered to the body. Uh, this is a literature known uh, mutant of the AAB. Uh, which uh, reported as a very good delivery system to the brain. So we repeat the experiment. Yes, it does go uh, slowly over 14 days. And, uh, but we actually did another target than the, the receptor. Uh, I can't really leave the target, but the, the grafting grafted the new AAV, uh, which makes it uh, better uh, the gene delivery. If you combine together with this type of things, now it becomes very cleaner uh, the, the delivery to the brain. So this method has a lot of potential. I can't really tell you too much about it, but it is a really a lot of potential to uh, design a vehicle to deliver specific uh, the tissues. So this, again, that's a graph technology. It's very easy to work on, and it's a plug and a play. And so 
I formed the company about five years ago, uh, maybe six, year, six years ago, Mira Biologics. And this is, uh, Mira comes from Miraku and Mirai in the future of Japanese. And uh, uh, we, we, we have been working together with the uh, big farmers as well as our, by ourselves. And I would like to thank to the, your attention and the people that my group is a really fantastic group of the people. As an international as this is school, my group is really meet a lot of international people uh, from Europe, from Australia, from America, from Canada, and a whole bunch of different places, Australia. And so uh, it's, it's really a great number of the people, and I have so many collaborators as well, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Any comment or question from the audience? Thank you for impress impressive talks. So I was wondering the binding model of the selected peptides. So you show the sum of structures. Is I, I think it's generally to bind to the active site or of enzymes, but is there any example to the like arosterical inhibition or something? Yes. So I show you the Plexin B1. That's not active site. That's a arosteric site. Oh, okay. And uh, MET is also probably at arosteric site. Mm -hmm. The experience we have, if you take enzyme, it goes to the active site. Mm. Because enzyme will design it to bind it to the peptide often. And so the, usually when you have a the, the, the site that are available for peptide, mm -hmm. it goes to there. But if you do take a membrane protein, mm -hmm. they don't have a particular binding site. They have a surface to interact with each other, mm -hmm. right? So then you actually don't have particular site. You have a lot of different peptide binding in different sites. So uh, depending on the target, Mm -hmm. We are not designing a peptide, right? We are yeah. designing a library, but we are not designing a peptide so that you don't restrict it to the mm -hmm. where it goes. Mm -hmm. So for enzymes, so when the selection steps is just to the binding. select the peptide to the binding, yes. so after that, so you're tested to the... Yeah, but as I told you, if you take enzyme, 100%, you get enzyme binding mm -hmm. to the active site. Interesting. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about how you modify the avian? I mean, just the general strategy. I, I think I missed some key details yeah, on the slide. So, sorry that I skipped. So the the sites that which are available, S1, S2 loops. I'm sorry that I really quick to go through this. I'm sorry. So uh, S1 site, S2 site is a possible site, but we took S2 site because once you change the S1 to something arbitrary sequence, it won't change anything. A little bit weaker infectious ability, but virtually the same. But when you touch the S2, completely lost. That means the S2 is a very important to interact. I don't know what the targets are, but it does important for infectious ability. So if you took S2, basically you lose, let's say I inserted, this case is we inserted the peptide binding to the Plexin B1, S2 site. And if it's a cell that doesn't have the uh, Plexin B1, it won't in infect because there's a no ways to bind, right? But then you inserted the uh, Plexin B1 peptide into the S2 start to infecting two Plexin B1 cells. So same, same thing you can demonstrate it here. So that the one that which, so, so this is actually a particular example is the background is almost at zero, so you see a really huge enhancement of the infectious ability. But in this case, so we, 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 we XX target, so that's, I won't say the target, but if you grafted this to the, the peptide sequence that binds to the this exec target in, in the brain, um, these are able to make it better uh, uh, delivery. This one is a little more complicated ways to design it, this to YYY2. And so it's, it's really important 
have a control that whether or not this is actually, so this uh, one thing is I have to say, this actually goes to there, uh, to the BBB, and then transport it into the brain vision, and then you have to infect it, right? But this has also ability to come back. So there's a, a way that which we did YYY, this has ability to bind to the, the brain cells. <laughs> And so we go effectively go to the infection over there. So it's transport and infect. So BB already has a the the BHP B already has a small peptide modification. You preserve that and you add onto that another modification. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Any other question? Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm interested in actually how efficient are those uh, microcyclic peptides comparing to small molecules in terms of their ADMT characteristics in general. Are they less, like, way less effective or, like, still are pretty competent with them in this what uh, effective, what, what was I said again? I'm sorry that I missed. Yeah, uh, um, AD, ADMT characteristics like all this toxicity excretion. How uh, is it? Yeah. Um, how uh, different are they from small molecules parameters? Like, I expect them to be, you know, a bit less uh, good in that, but are they still competitive in this, um, yeah. So the macro cycle is a very uh, poor, well actually, it's a very good selectivity against the target. And it's a, it doesn't have any off-target effect. And more, smaller molecule are actually very hydrophobic, right? So they have a very weak interactions with off-target. And that sometimes becomes a very problem. But macrocycle has a good balance of the hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity so that doesn't have any uh, off-target interaction. So, so far that we have done uh, animal studies as well as the big farmers has started already phase one, phase two, and uh, they don't have uh, uh, the side effect much. So I think it's a, now it's the, it, to be honest with you, it's a, we, we had a peptide informed, and then it's really huge impact in the industry. And uh, I think it, now it's like uh, Merck, uh, Genentech, uh, Novartis, J&J, uh, &J, Lidi, all these companies has a technology that which I developed. They actually got sub-licensing from peptide dream. So they are all using their, this, this technology for their own drug screen candidates. Uh, they realize that how good it is, how the molecules, how trustable, how uh, uh, easy to go through the phase one, phase, phase two, but it's, it's a probably, phase three is a, becomes a challenge a little bit, but you know, so far so good. So, so in other words, there are more data accumulating and that, that, that really helps a lot. And so that happens really uh, in the last uh, five years and it came, Came down, let it cool down. But there is one big success happens recently from the Merck, all are available peptide. Now it becomes a so big hit. Now it's like it, all the venture capitals want to start a small biotech for focusing on the macro cycle, all are available drug. So I think it, this is another big wave it's coming. And so uh, I think it, when it's coming, the, the, these waves and eventually get the, the, this drug to be a more popular and, and, and it's very stand, standard the drug development process to occur. And then it's probably we get to know more about such a uh, drug property, the critical drug property, yeah. Thank you, Professor Suga. Any other question? If not, uh, thank you. Okay.